Hello and welcome to the Friday, February 16th, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Sentinel-1 has an interesting update on phishing or I guess smishing campaigns that are using SMS messages in order to impersonate the United States Postal Service. You probably, at least if you're living in the US, have seen uh, these uh, SMS messages that claim to come from the Postal Service. Very popular, very common here. In the past, they often have used compromised accounts of business-to-consumer services like Twilio. And we have written in the past about scans looking for, for example, Twilio configuration files that include credentials. The latest target here appears to be AWS's SNS service. The SNS service or simple notification service also allows the sending of SMS messages. This move may in part be due to services like Twilio clamping down on mass sending of SMS messages. They have over the last year, I know with Twilio because I've used that myself, uh, implemented a number of measures in order to either apply rate limits or other measures to limit how many messages you are able to send using their service. And this may make these accounts less valuable, which is why they're now moving on to the AWS SNS service. And the Linux kernel project is attempting to become more transparent about vulnerabilities they're fixing. They have been criticized in the past for not really labeling properly all the vulnerabilities being fixed in various updates. Part of this uh, update is now that the Linux kernel project is actually a CNA, a CVE numbering authority, which will enable them to issue their own CVE numbers. A lot of uh, large software companies, Microsoft, Cisco and such, are CNAs. And you may notice that they, for example, often have these large lists of sequential CVE numbers. Just makes it easier than for the Linux kernel project to properly label any vulnerabilities being patched. Don't be too surprised if the number of vulnerabilities being published is now going up. This is not necessarily a result of a lower code quality or such, just basically better labeling of the vulnerabilities. And then a little bit more news from Evanti. At this point, researchers are just essentially having fun with the device and the numerous vulnerabilities. The latest write-up by Eclipsium does not really identify sort of any specific new vulnerability. It shows new, more compact, more efficient exploitation of old vulnerabilities and also analyzes some of the software that's installed on the device, which of course is as expected, pretty, pretty old. Well, it's Friday again, and yes, I do have a sans.edu student here with me. Jennifer, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm Jennifer Walker. I currently work as a, a Linux administrator, and previously I worked as a network engineer at the Naval Service Warfare Center in Card Rock. That uh, kind of leads also a little bit into your uh, topic here that you covered. And uh, that was actually sort of one of those things I think a lot of people don't think about, even though they probably should do more. And that's sort of layer one issues and how to detect uh, some rogue switches. Could you explain a little bit what the paper was about? So my paper was detecting rogue Ethernet switches. And one thing that I sort of realized as a network engineer who's worked on networks that, you know, the document documentation hasn't been kept on. So I had to go back through and make sure that we know all the switches that are connected is I realized with Ethernet switches, they don't have to put any packets on the network. So our usual ways of finding devices don't work with those Ethernet switches. So that's sort of where the idea for this uh, uh, research topic came from. So it's, you have a switch on network, nobody told you about it, maliciously or not. <laughs> And there is nothing enabled like that would broadcast some of these you know, Cisco discovery packets or anything like that. Right. You know, it doesn't even have to have spanning tree. It doesn't even have to have its own MAC address. So yeah. all the things you would try to do to detect something, uh, at least from 
the normal pack analysis uh, route um, doesn't necessarily work with uh, Ethernet switches. So yeah, I wanted to see if there were other ways to detect these. Now, one layer, one sort of physical layer way of doing it, I guess, is you just follow the cable, sir. But uh, that's not what you did. Uh, how did you sort of end up uh, attempting to detect these switches? So I am assuming that you have two known devices, and so you're checking to see if anything's between them. There's a couple of techniques I tried where basically it's the signaling on the wire between the devices, so I see both sides see that. And uh, the three ways I checked was uh, TDR, uh, which is a, um, a way of testing the physical cable itself, and then checking the auto negotiation values, and then finally literally just taking down the port and seeing if the other side of the port goes down. Okay, so uh, let's just start with the last one. Uh, did that work? Mostly. In one thing I found is a lot of the previous research I saw, they always did that on the switch side. And the only one I found that did it on the um, computer side, where you turn off the port on the computer side, uh, they had some interesting um, response where the port would go down and then immediately come up. And I was able to duplicate that. And I assume that's from IPMI, but I couldn't go yeah. into the BIOS and actually turn off everything to verify that. So... You know, it's not as straightforward as you would think. And also you're measuring um, a time difference. So your NTP has to be correct. The timing, it's, it's actually more complicated than you think. Uh, it's fine for like if you're manually troubleshooting something. But if you're trying to automate it, it's actually pretty difficult to, to feel confident that like when you turned off the thing, it actually did turn off the other side. Yeah, and that's really kind of, you know, for anybody listening here, what I liked about this paper is it uh, actually checks a lot of these assumptions. You know, there's a lot of things you sort of assume in networking or security and, well, you know, an assumption on verify becomes a vulnerability then very quickly, kind of, where you think something behaves a certain way. The TDR part, uh, that seems to be, in my opinion, kind of the, the methodology that should work the best, but... Uh, typically that requires special equipment or uh, how did you do that? So uh, TDR is a pretty standard function on a lot of Cisco switches and I use Cisco just because that was available to me um, but it's also available from a lot of vendors it's not specific to, to Cisco and uh, I also was looking through the eTool command and found out that that supported it. So I'm like, oh, you can do this on the server side now. Um, so I looked into that and I was able to do it on the server side, but it wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. Yeah. And uh, just uh, to introduce a TDR, for those who are not familiar with the acronym, that's a time domain reflectometry. You're kind of looking sort of at even breaks in cables or such you know, that cause small reflections. And then the, the way I've used it back in my physics days was sort of you know, with cables where you then literally have an oscilloscope hooked up and uh, you look sort of at these reflections coming back. But as you state, now some switches have that ability. Uh, I guess also when you just have this feature where it measures the cable length, is that usually TDR then in the switch? Yes, it's the TDR function that does that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it probably helps then if you know what the length is supposed to be or... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so uh, in my paper, what I said is you have to know the TDR length prior to mm. being any rogue devices on the network. Uh, so you have to have a standard on a good known network. You couldn't come to a uh, unknown network and use that and know that there's no rogue devices. And then the other issue I found is, of course, you can have, uh, you know, if your cable length is the same length, mm -hmm. um, it could still give you a false negative due to that, even if there is actually a rogue device between them. So it's not as accurate as uh, some of the other methods. But probably the in most interesting thing I found was um, you, with TDR, uh, it gives you the pair status. And if all the pairs are open, then that means that cable's connect disconnected. 
Whereas if it has one of the other statuses, uh, it's most likely connected to something. And you can tell that even if the machine is off. So this is a great way mm-hmm. that, you know, uh, you're, you're in your network closet and, uh, you know, a bunch of things are connected to the patch panel. But you're like, gosh, what is actually connected to something? And you can tell even if that remote machine's off. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. So basically, the if even if the remote, remote machine is turned off, it still shows up as connected. That's Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah, that's interesting. And that was without IPMI because that was of the other Yeah, thing correct. If it's completely yeah. off, you know, yeah, yeah, um yeah, you yeah, can yeah. still con- tell it's connected. So you get, if your network topology is out of date or someone connected something mm-hmm. they shouldn't, but it's just off when you're scanning, you could mm-hmm. still see that at least a device is connected there and then you can go track it down. Yeah, so in that case you would need sort of a periodic scan where uh you then look for change, basically. Yes. Yeah. Uh, is this readable with SNMP or something like this remotely, where you could easily pull switches? Yeah. So for the, yeah. for the Cisco switches, yes, they uh, they have an SNMP IMB that stores all the TDR information. So uh, you could have a script that just goes through each port and uh, uh, checks to see uh, if if uh, it comes back connected or not. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing. You don't cover it in your paper, but uh, earlier when I sort of went over it again, I thought about this. Uh, like when, when someone connects a remote, a, a rogue device to a network, they typically need to unplug the network cable and plug into the rogue device. Uh, that sort of short time when someone plugs it out, plugs it in, uh, do you think that's something detectable? I, it is detectable. The question is, um, is do your links go down enough in the network that that's you know from normal operations of rebooting people moving machines um you know maybe this is a rogue device that's between uh you know your switch in a conference room where people are going to be plugging their laptops all the time um so you would expect that to go up and down anyway or if you just Mm -hmm. have bad connections where your network goes up and down uh it wouldn't be useful to or it wouldn't give you a lot of information to grab that information but if it's a pretty um steady network you could use that but so in short if the network is big and complex enough where you need that remote monitoring it's probably too noisy to just use the sort of downtime yes yes Oh, well, that's uh, really cool. So uh, a link to the paper will be in the show notes. And uh, just bear you in your program now. Almost done or? I have finished. I am done. You have finished. You're all yes. finished and done. So ready to graduate and probably already got your certificate hanging on the wall there. <laughs> I <Yes>. did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks a lot uh, for joining me here. And again, the link will be in the show notes. Great paper. And one of those things you don't he really hear so much about definitely uh, worth a read thank you thank you that's it for today thanks for listening and talk to you again on monday bye